and a very warm welcome to what we hope will be quite a, a special series of Good, Bad and Rugby episodes. Um, those of you who've been with us for a while will know that we love open and thought-provoking conversations. We like to create spaces where our guests are able to go wherever they want. Um, and that is something we feel very passionately about. And the series that we're doing, and this episode in particular, is absolutely no different. We are doing this in conjunction with Vodafone. This is the Vodafone Breaking Through series. And what we are looking to do is to dive deep into the journeys, the challenges and the experiences that our guests have been through. In this series, we envisage a message uh, to our audience that tackles the question, how can we all be just a little bit better in 2021? Um, and what do we mean by better? Perhaps a bit more accepting, understanding, sympathetic. There's a lot of transmit in the world at the moment and there's not necessarily a lot of listening. And that is the hope over the course of three short shows that we just have a little bit of a time out to understand, to listen and to perhaps come away with one or two learnings as we move forward. We also hope to be able to shed a light on a world of rugby that is totally inclusive and accepting. It's something that we'll all have seen, it's something we'll all have read about and we very much passionately believe that given the audience we have at Good, Bad and Rugby, we should be doing our bit as well. And a man who is very passionate about this topic is our very own half, who has kindly put aside his eggs to join us this morning. It is something you're very passionate about. And that's why I think we're able to, to do this with real sort of genuine interest, is that this is a story and this is a movement and this is a, a topic that you have spoken about in great detail and and actually put your, your action into... In, into into action as well, if that makes sense. Your words into action, if you know what I mean. Why? Yeah, I mean, well, it, it, uh, for so many reasons. Firstly, I think um, for a lot of people in the LGBT plus community, I, I may look like somebody that may not be accepting. I may have all the, the traits or, or the kind of demeanor that maybe you would think wouldn't be sort of passionate about this and I think firstly that couldn't be further from the truth I always kind of feel a bit of a passion towards people who have to go through this kind of journey um, and how scary it can be and I've reached out to lots of different people and seen firsthand how hard it could be but also talking to even people like you know Caitlyn Jenner when I was in the jungle and just her kind of complete fear of what was going to happen you know so many people you know, it would become, become, become suicidal about this kind of stuff. You know, we talked about to, to Nigel Owens about it. Um, you know, it, people feel that so much pressure to do this. And actually, interesting, even, you know, with, with Caitlin, you know, that, that huge transition she went through, she, she discovered that everybody was so um, kind of welcoming and the people that mattered were welcoming. And, and I kind of want to fight the good fight to be as much of an ally as I can to, to everybody to show A, we're all supportive. B, it actually doesn't matter uh, what you are and how you are. And that, you know, as long as you're a good person, that's all I'm really interested in. Amen. Wise words. Let's bring our first guest to the series, who I'm told is a chemistry-loving sports psychology graduate. But most of us will know him as the super talented English referee that is Craig Maxwell Keys. Thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, we're all right, actually. I think you, you, you've joined this call before we started recording. You're full of positivity. And I think Hask and I are still trying to work out which way we're facing. It's early <laughs> and I'm not sure the coffee's kicked in. Um, it's very good of you to join us. Out of, out of interest, why? Why did you want to join this? Well, I think like, like Hask has said, I think it's, this is a great, great platform. It's got great, great coverage. And it's, as you outlined in the start, Alex, it's trying to, trying to do good things. And this is a great topic that I've become passionate about talking about a lot more, a lot more recently. Um, so thank you for giving me that platform. Well, we're delighted to have you on. Let's get into let me let's get into the the big stuff. It's obviously it's a big old topic, isn't it? And you have been on on quite a journey. Um, it's never easy to sort of put yourself out there. But tell us when it was that you first and, and how you found the confidence to tell your friends and your family that you know what you wanted to be in life was a referee. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's a, it's a great one, actually. All of them, when they found out I was refereeing, were like, nah, there's no way you can be a referee. You're a quiet, shy introvert. There's no way that, that you can possibly do that. And yeah, I become a different person when I step over that white line, it appears. Um, because away from the rugby pitch, I will shy away from conflict as much as I can. Yet on the pitch, I'm thrown into the middle of it. I'm joking, obviously. I just, I, it, you've obviously got a fine line to walk at the moment because, you know, refs, actually refs at the moment have got a very good name in the game, but you've got so much more to your story 
um, as well. Is is a conversation like this, and and I suppose you know we've we've spoken prior to recording about the things we'd like to get into. Is it does this feel very natural to you now? Is it is it a very easy conversation to have, or do you still have to take a bit of a deep breath and think, I'm doing this for the right reasons? Let's get into it. Do you know what I mean? Um, no, definitely. It's it's an easier conversation to have than it's ever been, but. I'd be lying if I said there still wasn't the apprehension, not the apprehension about me being honest. I'm quite happy to be honest about my story and where I was and how I feel about things. But still, even me, I've got the apprehension of saying stuff that will offend people. Um, so it's 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 my view, it's my perspective on it. There is no right or wrong, I suppose, way of, of talking about this, particularly when it comes to like giving advice or people and the journey they've been on. It's so unique to individuals. Uh, this is simply my take on it. But yeah, nerves about offending people, yeah, that still affects me. And is that something that you notice on a day-to-day basis? Is it something that happens once in a blue moon? I mean, you know, how often do, do your fears actually manifest themselves? Um, probably not not that frequently. Um, it's more the fears of other people. I'm talking to a lot more people nowadays that want to ask me questions, want to delve into to sort of my journey, but don't know how to phrase what they want to say, or they're so petrified of saying something that will offend me, they just skirt around the issue, um, which I think is is a problem in itself. Um, So that's probably the biggest challenge that I'm facing, is the fear of other people not wanting to offend people, so not talking about stuff, which is exactly the wrong thing, I think. I mean, I I sort of sit sometimes in in, in a similar situation, um, because it is a bit of a minefield out there, but I think, do you, th- do you think this is the case because it, we're just in a real period of readjustment where we were sort of perhaps for a long time not where we wanted to be and then we've kind of we're now overcompensating and people who have who have feel maybe have struggled are now coming back to to really um you know sort of the best but now now sort of going over it because they really want to make sure it never happens again uh, there probably yeah, probably is a bit of that, isn't there? And it probably links back to what you said at the start, Alex, about listening. I think people need to do a lot more listening. And if the person you're listening to is trying to do the right thing and is coming at it from the right angle, then they need to be given a bit of slack to be allowed to have that conversation. Uh, I, this this is fascinating because actually what what you're saying here, I think I would very very directly put onto my shoulders, which is I think if you look at the world today you know, 10% at the top are shouting madly and, and are hard to listen to. The 10% at the bottom are, are very sort of passionate and are doing it the right way. And there's probably a chunk of people, 80% of the middle, who who consider themselves good people and want to do the right thing, but are nervous of the top 10% and getting it wrong and sort of nervous of the bottom 10% and not getting it right. And and that possibly, if I'm being very open about this, is where I sit. I, I It's 2021, you know, I, I'm... And I mean this with the greatest respect. I, I want nothing but happiness for people on their journey. And none of it's really my business. And and I think the reason I say that is that what I would like to get out of this from my perspective is understanding how and why it's important that I don't just do nothing because 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 I'm frightened of it, if you see what I mean. And do you I wondered if you had a response to that in the way that, you know, and, and the journey that you've been on. There are a lot of good people out there who want to do the right thing, but they're terrified of getting it wrong. Yeah, no, I think that's that's the massive challenge that we, we face to, to want to address. Like, I think before I, I came on, I think there's some new new stats out that I read, obviously, with it being Pride Month. I think you look at rugby clubs, so the 60% of people will use or hear gay, you know, gay slurs used, but 90% of people would welcome someone from the LGBTQ plus community to a rugby club. Now, clearly, there's a massive disconnect there. So you're not going to be able to welcome someone if you're using gay slurs in your club so that disconnect obviously is what needs addressing and yeah it's, it's how you go about doing that um which is the next frontier because like you look at quins they have their pride match pride month the rfu i think is going to march in the pride sort of um event when it happens in september those are great catalysts to start a conversation but it's, it's the work that goes on behind them that i think needs a lot more focus because that's what will yield change in a grassroots level and that's probably where we're going to start making it a lot more comfortable for people to have those conversations that you talk about, Alex. Interesting. I, I would say that I, I think that's probably the biggest, taking the kind of the, the minefield about, you know, using the right language. Um, 
I think the, the, the biggest issue for me and one of the pitfalls that I have, and, and this is why I never, ever, ever pretend to be um, white and white, is just the, you, using homophobic, lang homophobic language and the way it is used in, in sport, you know, because I genuinely, genuinely believe of all the clubs I've played at, if a player felt like he wanted to address his sexuality and come out, I don't think there would ever be any issue. I don't think it would anybody would say anything but then exactly what you're saying in terms of the use of like that's gay this is gay whatever that happens way too often and actually towards the end of my career in a couple of times in the change room people would use language that they weren't they weren't they weren't using it in a homophobic manner but they were using it um because it become common parlance and that for me is something that we have to consistently address and i actually think bizarrely uh, some of these younger kids coming through now are um, a lot better at it. You know, I actually hear some kids, you know, they wouldn't say that. I, you know, I, I talk to some, some parents and, and their kids are coming to them and saying, dad, you can't, mm. you can't say that. This can't be said, this, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is some positive change, but I think, um, I think certainly that for me is an issue. Um, Craig, tell me a little bit, I want to come back to obviously what, you know, the current scenario and, and, and perhaps a sort of an action point or two for people. But tell me about your journey, first of all. Um, my journey, um, probably started university. Um, and then I went off to be, as you mentioned earlier, went into the world of pharmaceutical science for two years. Um, what, what which would be quite involved, in, just as an aside, what, what, what is that? Uh, up in the beautiful part of Cambridgeshire, so over in Ely. So we were working with a load of major pharma companies on a whole host of drugs, from blood pressure drugs to drugs to treat Alzheimer's. Um, so it would have been a fascinating field at the moment. I'm not going to yeah. lie with, with vaccine development. But yeah, then, well, in my parents' eyes at the time, I threw it all away to become a rugby referee. <laughs> it was their take on it, having spent four years and thousands of pounds getting a degree. I think in my eyes, you've thrown it away becoming a rugby referee as well. <laughs> I, did, I, didn't, I didn't know that's what you were doing. What were you thinking? <laughs> oh, yeah, chasing a dream, eh? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's when it started. Um, and to be fair, the transition into refereeing probably delayed me, me coming out. Um, purely because it was a new job. It was a world that I didn't know about um, professional sport. So all I knew about it was the back where it was then. I was very apprehensive about it, didn't know how it would react. So it probably took me another two years to come out to, to friends and family after signing up at, at Twickenham for those first two years. Now, look, with hindsight, there's no point me delaying. I could have come out there and then and it wouldn't have been an issue. But that wasn't how I perceived it, looking from the outside in, as it was when I joined Twickenham. Did you have to, let's deal with sort of friends and family first of all, did you have to deal, was that, was that quite a run up to that or were you surrounded by people who probably knew and, and it was more of a confirmatory thing? Was that a big deep breath, I'm going to have to break it big time or was it more just a bit of confirmation? Um, it was break it big time. Um, really? There wasn't many people, your mum always claims that she knows, <laughs> she knows best and she knew, but everyone else was, yeah, it was a shock, it was a curveball um, and it probably is the biggest regret, like it's doubting those closest to you i mean there's always a really rare example where they they don't back you up and, and still love you irrespective but yeah that was a massive massive step massive source of delay i think i had four full starts at trying to tell them and then eventually got around and actually did it the balance tipped and i, I plucked up the courage to do it yeah they, they're absolutely fine about it but that's my biggest regret it's not trusting them with that earlier do, do you feel like because of because of that not not coming out early you could have been yourself for a much more a much more extended period of time. A hundred percent. And like, I know the RPA runs that lift the weight campaign, but it wasn't until I came out that I could actually relate to that statement. You don't realize how much energy goes into sewing that, call it what you will, a web of deceit or making up all these sort of alias stories. Because at the time I joined Twicken, I was the only single person in that referees changing room. So you can imagine the scrutiny that you come under about who you're seeing, you go away for weekends to European games on the continent and they're constantly trying to set you up with people. That's the environment that I, that I was in. And yeah, it took a lot of energy to, to spin that web of deceit so that people didn't start questioning my sexuality uh, back at the time. So it's only when yeah, you, you come out and you haven't got that on your shoulders that you, that you realise how much energy you've got to reinvest in just being you. Do you look back at that period now and put your head in your hands and just like, oh my Lord, or do you look back and sort of laugh at the... The ridiculousness of it all oh it's both I, I laugh at lots of it and i also cringe at parts of it <laughs> um it was just would have been so much simpler for me to just 
come out and <laughs> and tell them. And then the laughs probably would have been greater and louder. <laughs> Absolutely. And what was it about the fourth attempt that made you jump, whereas three times you'd approached it and, and pulled out? Um, I was surrounded by more and more people who had other halves to share stuff with, whether it was their successes or their failures. And they were going on a journey through life with them. And I didn't have that. And I was never going to have that unless I came out. Um, so that's probably what tipped the balance. Um, so all the fears about how people would react and, and whatever else out there was, was soon outweighed by the fact that I want to live my life and I want to share it with someone else. Did you have any concerns about how once you address it with your family, the rugby community would take it and how you'd be able to, to do your job? Uh, to be honest with you, I was probably naive to that. I never even, rugby was always a safe space for me. So whenever I went into like a match day, like I was very disconnected from sort of my personal world. It was game face on, I'm there to do a job. And the saying that rugby doesn't really care who you are, where you're from. It just provides you do your job. That's all it, it really matters. Um, so yeah, that, that for me wasn't, wasn't an issue and look, based on how the the players the coaches and the my fellow referees reacted it was nothing but a, a wave of positivity and it's probably the one thing that struck me was how many people went out of their way to talk to me message me and to pass that on that is really interesting i mean to sort of pick up on it i mean has rugby been a very safe space for you in that regard are, and, and are you surprised by the level of positivity it has been a, it's been a really safe space am i surprised by the level of positivity I probably am, but I probably shouldn't be. Um, now I know a lot of the people there. I think I've been full time for what seven years. So you get to know people really well. I, I, I shouldn't be surprised that it was that positive, but it's still quite nice to see that that it does have that reaction. Do you think it made made life a little bit easier having someone like Nigel become out and, and so focused? Because when we talk to for example, a lot of women's rugby players about their careers, more often than not, this top generation now said that when they were coming through they had no sort of peers they had no inspiration there was no one at the top of the game now you know your Emily Scarrett's and um you know Nolly Waterman's they've been there and done that so these young girls coming through are now have kind of figureheads and inspirations and I wonder for someone like yourself whether seeing Nigel be so vocal actually I don't know if you've looked into his journey but we you know we we had him on the, the show and I I knew that it was it was difficult for him especially coming from you know, a Welsh, you know, a Welsh Valley where, you know, he, uh, he I mean, I think he says his dad, Manith and they were Ke talking about- Manith Kerrig. Manith Kerrig. the way he says, Manith Kerrig. Manith Kerrig. And he said, and his dad, you know, his dad, they were talking about sort of gay people and his dad just didn't, there was just a complete, like, I don't know, what do you mean gay people? And it wasn't even, it didn't even register. So I, I just wondered for you, whether that was kind of a bit of a shining light at the end of the tunnel or whether you just didn't clock it. No, I, I sat down with Nigel in the exotic place that was Anandos over in Cardiff and had, and had a chat with him so he could get his Nando's points for his platinum membership. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that clearly that, that massively helps because, as you say, you, there's someone that's been there, done it, been openly gay, and, yeah, it, it tells you that it is possible. Um, so it, it clearly massively helps. And that probably was part of the catalyst for me speaking out when I did three years ago. It's always I always said I wanted to try and inspire or help help other people through telling my story um so it probably yeah was from nigel doing it is where my inspiration to do it myself came from have you now had people do you now see yourself as a bit of an inspiration do you understand that what while, while you've lifted the weight on your own shoulders you're actually now potentially going to help other people lift it and you've become a role model whether you actually wanted it or not and that's the that's sometimes the hardest thing with these things is that you you're like oh, i'll just get my stuff in order but actually there's probably somebody a young guy in these environments looking at you going well you know I, I need to speak that and reach out to him i want him to be my inspiration no 100 percent. as you say there definitely it's an indirect consequence but it's a very good indirect consequence so yeah there's been a few people either themselves message me or speak to me and say they've plucked up the courage to tell their i think there's one guy that had told his mum but not his dad and i gave him the courage apparently so he could tell his dad and there's other people whose friends have just said look I know someone who's gay and like your story just helps normalize it a bit more um but that's very much an indirect consequence because from the selfish part of me as you said Haskell, I was sorting out my life <laughs> um one of the things that we're very keen to do in this series is to ask the, the, the guests who come on to leave a few postcards for people who might want a bit of a reference point if they're on a journey of their own and we're going to put these on our website and I'm sure we'll do some social media around them as well so it's just people who perhaps are 
starting out on it or they are trying to work out which which direction you know to take etc and those like you Craig who've been there and done it and have broken through etc your views and your and your your thoughts I think will be hugely helpful so we asked you to, to submit a few questions a few answers to some of our questions and I'm just going to pick a couple of them out um, here and we'll put, pop them up on the website as I say so the first one we asked you was my greatest fear was dot 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 and I conquered it by dot 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 yeah so greatest fear was losing those closest to me um, I think I conquered it by realizing that I was losing a lot more by choosing to live a lie um, so that and that was only the only reason I got that perspective was time um, and everyone's journey to coming out is very different it takes completely different lengths of time some people never get there but yeah the longer I was in the closet yeah, I realized I was I was losing a lot more by by living a lie and was that a gradual process or was that a sort of massive penny drop I cannot keep doing this kind of deceit to myself type thing it is very incremental it's very incremental and as you as it got closer and closer when I came out, yeah, it, it piled on quite quickly. So it did change at the end pretty rapidly um, okay. to me to, to get to that point. The second one we asked you, and I think it's always really important, actually. Often there's a lot more cut through when people... It's exactly how I deal with my children. If you, if you shout at them, they don't listen. If you encourage <laughs> them and you talk to them and you engage with them, they do whatever you want. And I often think humour is a very good way to get cut through, particularly in conversations where, you know, there is a, a real significance to it. So we did ask you, the funniest moment on my journey was dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Being told that I couldn't possibly be gay because I've got a shocking dress sense, can't sing and I can't dance. <laughs> All of the above being true. Um, Come on. If, if you're going to take to the dance floor, what, what, what is your weapon of choice? A little rumba, a little salsa? What, what have we got in the locker? Oh, no, I'm not. I normally, my, sort of my OCD kicks in and I normally go to the dance floor to arrange the Macarena so everyone's doing it in the same direction <laughs> <laughs> and not all over the place at once. Yeah. I think Macarena <laughs> may have just given away something I, there. There's a, there's a little uh... Yeah, Craig, you're definitely gay if you're organising a Macarena. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, there's no... Yeah. Um, but would, was there, were there funny moments on the journey for you? Were there moments um, of sort of just extraordinary ridiculousness? Um, probably not. It still amuses me now when other people sort of still point out, well, he's more likely to be gay than you for these reasons. Um, that, that still gets me, but it's refreshing going back to what we said earlier, that they can have those conversations and they're not scared to have those conversations because like all the people I work even the person that made that comment, um, I think has since questioned whether he should have said it. I'm like, mate, I, I know you're an ally. I know your heart's in the right place. So it's very different to someone whose heart isn't in the right place and is just trying to have a cheap shot at you. Yeah. Um, the next postcard we asked you to answer was, I learnt most from dot, dot, dot. Yeah, so I, I discovered a load of, sort of LGBT sort of Q plus vloggers on YouTube and I just sort of watched their journey through life. And that's, that's probably what shone the light as much as Nigel on this is what you can have. <laughs> this is what's possible. Um, so, yeah, going and doing that, that research, I suppose living my life through someone else's lens um, is what got me to the point where sort of, yeah, I want to live that life myself and not just watch it on YouTube. <laughs> Good on you. Um, we'll put some links up as well, actually, if people are looking for things to, to inspire and to help and to educate, etc. cetera. Um, the one piece of advice I wish I could have told myself is... Don't doubt the love and support of those closest to you. That's, that's the biggest single one because that, that delayed me coming out for a low, long time and probably was the biggest source of angst. Uh, and it's my biggest source of embarrassment now that I should ever doubt those people that were never going to push me away. Uh, why did you doubt them? Was that on you or was that on them? Probably on me and my own insecurities. I think a quote that I picked up a few years ago is how can I ask other people to love me when I can't even love myself? Um, so it was me accepting who I was before I could then ask others, others to do it in return. Um, it probably links into that. With that... Um... With that kind of thought process and, and it's a very we sort of touched on it at the start a very kind of standard belief that that you know if if how can someone accept you if you don't accept yourself and you know that that fear of the unknown do you think there's anything more we could do or something that would that would try to help reassure people that that's not the case i mean is there a lesson you've learned perhaps or is it still just down to the individual i think it's too far i think part of it is down to the individual going on their journey because you don't want to pressurize anyone into to doing something sooner than they're, they're ready to. 
But from, I mean, from a rugby perspective, it goes back to what we touched on earlier as well. If rugby clubs are at the heart of their community um, and some places it's the very epicenter of a community. So it's going back to the language and what they hear in and around that club to create as, as safe a space as, as possible so that they don't have those lingering doubts. Because, um, for example, like one of the things that was lately coming out was someone that I know said, oh, if you want to progress refereeing wise, just say you're gay and then it will tick a load of boxes so they'll promote you really fast. Now, that person is one of my greatest supporters and an ally. But at the time I was in the closet, that completely threw me because I then didn't want to come out anytime soon, have my career take off, because then they'd be like, yes, he told you so. Um, so it's being aware of the consequences of what you say to who you say is the massive piece. That is a very good takeaway. I think that might be the moment. Um, that certainly, yeah, is, is a, that's a very powerful statement that you've made there. Um, moving on, if you're ever stuck, you should dot, dot, dot. This was probably the hardest one to answer, but I said you should just dream and then make it happen. Now, that could that dream could be something very small, like you could just be in the bottom, bottom of a rut and want to get to a positive place. And then how you get out that rut, whether it's talk to someone, um, which is probably the best thing to do, or it could be dreaming big about refereeing a World Cup final. So whatever the scale you apply it to, yeah, dream and then put a plan in place to make it happen. And when did you realise on your journey that you weren't trying to fulfil dreams, you were too busy running from nightmares type thing? That probably dawned on me quite <clears throat> quite late on before I before I came out. Um, I very much got the feeling by then that I was just running around firefighting, loads of different scenarios to protect my secret. Um, and then you have no time and energy left to do anything, let alone dream. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing that surprises me most is... Um, how far we've come, which is often forgotten about. There has been a lot of progress in rugby and society generally, um, but there's a lot more to do. I think I saw a stat the other day that I think it's, it's only legal in what less than 30 countries in the world for gay people to marry, and there's 168 countries or something like that in the world. So a lot's been done, but when I saw that stat, I was like, wow, there's probably a long way to go here as well. I mean, I, I um, when we knew we were kind of going to do these interviews, I, I, you know, I looked at the Sky News yesterday and in Turkey, uh, I think it was, you know, a LGBT plus Q event, pride event, but people are getting arrested and beaten up. You're like, how are we still, how are we still doing this? But then, but then I think, you know, in this period of lockdown, lots of issues came to the, to, to the fore. And, and, and I think it goes back to, look, I, I never would, I would never want to be offensive. I think common, common sense and context is always lost on social media and online. But while stuff like that is still going ahead, you know, I think um, we have a lot of work to do. And I, and I think for me, rugby can be a real shining light for that because, you know, the perception, as I said, is, you know, we are the antithesis of what you would expect to be an accommodating environment. Yeah, I think we can be a shining light to that. And I think so many people, um, it doesn't, it, you know, would be so supportive. And I think if it's just trying to reassure those that, that aren't comfortable, because I think what, what, what I said is, and exactly what you're saying is that how tiring is it living your life as somebody or not? Mm -hmm. Like it, 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 I can't, I can't imagine how hard that would be uh, to have that burden of secrets and stuff and concerns and fears. It, as I said, it's hard enough to do that. And I think we can do so much more to, um, to, to help promote that. But also, like you said, understand that we've come, a, we've come a long way. And I think, I just want, I, I think if we were tested. You know what I mean? If we were tested, there's a judgment to test come in. I think we would pass it. Like, I think we would we would do that. And I want more people to 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 feel like they can because I just think it would be a conversation, of lads. Um, I feel like I need to come out. But like, right, okay, sweet. Let's just move on, and it doesn't matter. And we're here for you. We love you, and let's just crack on because that's what's important, really. I th I think I think that's a very good point. I think I think there are a lot of people who. So it, we're sort of we're, we're far enough along the journey now that it, it doesn't matter and I suppose that's that's one of the things I was going to put to you is that from my perspective I'm like I, I don't mind whether you're I, I, it doesn't mean anything to me it's, it's like not an issue and I but it, that that doesn't necessarily feel like that is enough right now Craig or, or is it I don't know I mean if, if I was to say to you great Craig really pleased for you well done I mean I, I it does I don't I don't have any reaction to it because it doesn't it doesn't affect me in any way. It's it, it's not about me. It's not about you. I'm, I I sort of don't know what to say because I'm like great, and therefore when people are expecting something from you and you're like, but I'm just really pleased for you. Let's crack on to something else. 
is that enough? Do you know what I'm trying to say? I'm doing it really badly. No, it's, it, it's 100% enough. For like most people ask me like, well, how was the reaction? And probably yeah, 90% of the reaction was, was that like, great. And next, what we're we going to next. talk about now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's a great reaction. Um, so, so yeah, but going back to, I think a point was just raised, like I was on a webinar the other day and like the point was made from rugby's perspective, like, what more can it do beyond what it's doing? Like we still have inclusive rugby clubs. So surely the acid test should be, we don't need inclusive rugby clubs because individuals are quite happy to go to any club in their community and feel a part of it and play. And I think that's the next frontier that we, we need to crack. Okay. And that does lead us on to your final postcard, which we're going to put on the website. To me, rugby has dot, dot, dot. Oh, look, it's, it's allowed me to be me. And there's so many places where people work where it probably wouldn't be as, as good an environment to be in. So I'm really lucky from that perspective. Um, but yeah, that doesn't mean we can sort of rest on our laurels. And I think I've just, as I said, I just referenced something that, that can be done um, to move it on within rugby. And I think rugby's got a great place. Like the RFU, all the premiership clubs have these community outreach programs. If even just for Pride Month, they incorporated in those programs a bit of awareness around sort of LGBTQ plus matters um, would be in a better place. Um, it would also be in a better place if more people like you, Alex, were asking, what more can I do to be a better person and a better human? If, if just one, one in 10 people ask themselves that question every day, <laughs> we'd move the debate on X-fold. Yeah. I'm really anxious that we are not, and, and I don't think we ever will be, that sort of... I think, I, think, I think we want to ask the question, but just to do it in a very gentle way. I don't think we are you know, evangelists and, and drivers of, of change. But I think what we hopefully represent are that 80% that I referenced at the beginning, where people just consider themselves good people and are trying to do the right thing, but don't at this point in time necessarily know what that right thing is. And I think, Craig, you know, your, your story and your, you know, the way you've sort of informed us is, is hugely kind of inspiring. Uh, it's about allowing people to, to be themselves. Are there things that you'd like to include in this that we, we haven't got to? I'm conscious that it's, there's, a, there's a journey for you and, and we're, we're trying to gently just encourage people to be, to be a bit more understanding and a bit more, I suppose, educated and, and supported. But are there other things that you'd like to touch on in this that we haven't? I think you've done a really good job at touching on some of the key points. And yeah, it'll give people, hopefully give people one or two things to think about, which is progress, isn't it? If yeah. they think about it and then take it away and, and act on it. Good on you. Um, what's next for you? What's in the diary? What's on the to-do list? The to-do list is we've had the Premiership final, so we're now, we're now done until pre-season fitness, which has already gone in the diary, which is exactly what you want to see at the start of your first week <laughs> off is, is the fitness camp go in the diary. Um, so no, a few holidays, um, hopefully abroad, and then domestically as well. And then we, we start again in, what is it, 81 days or something, as our boss keeps telling us. Right, and counting. Um, Hask, anything to sum up? Any thoughts? No, I just think, look, it's an, it's an amazing journey. And I, and I think, um, you know, to hear, what you've, to hear what you've been through, and I think the lessons you learned are applicable to, to anybody. It's not necessarily about sexuality. It's about anything. It's about, the, you know, you know li trying to live to be yourself and not to be something else is, is key. I think being... Like you said, dreaming, trying to address stuff and be honest and open and value those people around you. And I remember, I think I was uh, listening to somebody, uh, well, we, actually we interviewed Sam Orbiton the other day and he and he was talking about having spoken to somebody, you know, if you've got love of your family, your health and um, kind of good friends around you, that is what, it, what's important in life. And I think the people going through... Um, a struggle understand that and a lot more and a lot more people are understanding than you would give them credit for and i think what you're doing is brilliant i'm so glad you're able to be to be happy um and you know we expect some major more things in and hopefully see you referee in a world cup final can i ask a final question craig given everything you've you've spoken about the journey and the challenges and the fears etc now that you've you, you've broken through all of that how happy are you out of 10 and i don't mean that in a sort of a weighty question but do you look back now and think, Christ alive, that was that was bloody hard work, but I've made it through? Or are you still on that journey to, to get to where you want to? I think you're always on that journey trying to get to where you want to, setting yourself new challenges every week. But I think I thought I was happy back, at, back when I was in the closet because there was lots going on in my life. Despite the fact I wasn't out, 
I had a new exciting career after university. My refereeing was going really well. So I thought I was happy. Um, but I was happier when I came out of the closet. Very good answer. Very good answer. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. It's been really enjoyable. It's been it's been fascinating. It's been educational, which is exactly what we wanted on this uh, Vodafone Breaking Through series. And I hope that there will be a lot of people who listen, who are understanding. And I hope there'll be one or two who take what you've given us in your postcards and it helps them on their journey as well. Good on you, Craig. Have a happy summer. And we'll see you back in the test arena and on premiership grounds before too long. We very much hope. Thanks so much for your time. Brilliant. Thanks, both.